All righty, good. Let's all stand. 510, it'll be up on the screen. Heaven came down. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. just singing that, I was reminded of uh, something we used to sing and do in my home church, my very earliest church, where I was saved and where I grew up through my early childhood. And y'all may remember this. Every now and then, we would sing this song. It's really not a, not really a, a deep theological song. It's a kind of a real good, feel good kind of exercise, but we would sing, it was on a Monday, somebody touched me. Y'all remember that? How many of you remember that? Or it was on a Tuesday. We'd sing each day of the week, and when it got to the day of the week that you were saved on, you would stand up. Y'all remember that? I just am curious tonight, how many of you remember the day of the week on which you were saved. Do you remember? All right. Heaven came down, glory filled your soul. What day of the week was it? Somebody over here. Sunday. It was on a Sunday. Now that's pretty typical for most people. You know, when we would sing through that, you know, it was like half the crowd at least would stand up when we got to a Sunday. So for you, how many of you did glory come down and heaven come down and glory fill you? So on a Sunday, Sunday, all right, most of you in the room. How many was Monday? Any Mondays? Tuesday? 
at least one Tuesday at the Horse Creek Baptist Church in Manchester, Kentucky. Right, Mr. Eddie? During revival. Brother Rush was the pastor there. Amen. Tuesday, Wednesday. That's the next most popular day. One on a Wednesday. Anybody else? A Thursday. A couple on Thursday. Friday. Two on a Friday. A Saturday. A couple on Saturday. And then we would always do this at the end of the song. I don't recall which day it was, but somebody touched me. Amen. So... How many of you would that include? Okay, <laughs> all right. You don't remember exactly what day of the week it was, but you remember it happening. And that is the most important thing. Heaven came down and glory filled your soul. Well, that's great news to share tonight. I'll tell you, let me tell you uh, some more great news is, you know, we're going to have a special service Sunday night at 5 o'clock. Instead of at 6 o'clock, we'll start at 5 o'clock we're going to gather under the picnic shelter, the pavilion, whatever you prefer to call it. And we are going to have 19 baptisms. We have had uh, 19 young people to profess faith in the Lord Jesus and uh, come to know him. And so we're thankful for what God is doing there. And we just wanted to do it in a special way. But that's going to be a wonderful event. So Next Sunday at 5 p.m., we'll do that, have a baptismal service outside there, and then right after that, we're just going to continue to celebrate that with church-wide fellowship. Church is providing drinks, hot dogs, hamburgers, and we're bringing sides and trimmings, all right, and a dessert. That wouldn't be bad either, so we look forward to that next Sunday. A couple other quick announcements before we begin to give some praise reports. So start thinking about what you want to mention aloud tonight in regard to something that you've seen the Lord do, maybe in your life or the life of somebody else recently. But a couple more announcements. First of all, we have a group of young people heading out on a retreat this weekend and there's been some conversations with, with some of you about providing a lunch for them uh, on Friday before they leave. And if you would like to help with that, participate in that, Lori, do they speak to you about that? All right, speak to Miss Lori about that. Also, uh, some of you have sponsored uh, one or more of the kids that are going. And if you haven't had a chance to share that, uh, Stephen asked that you would go ahead and share that tonight. If you can't get with him after the service, Miss Donna, he said you would take care of it. All right. That may be news to you, but that's what I was told. All right. So remember those announcements tonight. But let's talk about good things. Who has a praise report? Something you want to just share with everybody that you've seen God do in the last few days. Yes, Ronnie? Yes. Thank God for, for some rain. We did need it. Anybody else? Maybe for retirement without uh, any severe injuries or having a hurry and have a severe Amen. Amen. <laughs> we praise God for that report. That's awesome. Anybody else? Yes. I'm thankful that Maggie and Jesse got married and that we have a whole house full of company and it was wonderful a couple weeks we had everybody. Yeah, amen. Amen. Anyone else? I've heard from there we go, Mr. Eddie. The Lord called my brother. In Christ, home, yes. Okay. Can't say. Pray for that family, but grateful for him. Any, anybody else? I'm just glad that the Lord saved me. I know that in my death is up, that I'm going to get a big box of death. 
Because I invited the Lord and good work getting to say now. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you, Amanda. It's a good testimony. Anybody else? Thankful for little Ansel came through this surgery. Yeah, so Ethan's little grandson Ansel had a little issue and not a little issue, it's a big thing for a little one like that and uh, had surgery this morning at UK Hospital and all that went really well. So we're grateful for that. Anybody else? Yes. That was going to be my announcement, but uh, that's okay that Lori does. Oh, sorry. No, you're fine. But uh, anyway, he, he is doing really good. He's got one more feed in, and if he holds it down, he may get to come home tonight. Praise so the Lord. So thank everyone for their prayers. Amen. Anybody else? Maybe I'll be still better. Praise the Lord. I'm Brother. thankful for my salvation. I'm thankful for the years that the Lord used me. I'm looking forward to the future. I don't have many years left, but I want to give what I have to the Lord. I'm yeah. glad that I found a church such as this that I can worship the Lord together with the people. I'm looking forward to getting acquainted with all of them. Amen. Thank you, Brother Watkins. We're so glad you're here. Anybody else? Yes. I am just thankful to be here tonight. It seems like forever since I've been in church. Good to see you. Good to be here. Uh, our Wednesday night schedule has been unusual <laughs> the last uh, few weeks, and it is good for us all to be together. Anybody else? What about from on high? You know, I pick on these down here. Yes, Brother Bill? Well, yeah, I'm thankful for the Lord. And put that with me for 60 years. Uh, amen. <laughs> Being saved and having a good wife. You know, the Bible says he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And so we're thankful for that. <laughs> Was there somebody over here? Anybody else? Any, yes, darling. I'm thankful for the work that Rogers does to expand the space in the choir room in there so yeah. we have room for our music. <coughs> Amen. Amen. That's good. They we're out of room we're out of room in there and making some provision there and we're grateful for that. Thank you, Roger. Anybody else? My daughter's coming home tomorrow. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, let's take a few moments tonight just to uh, close our eyes and bow our heads and uh, have a moment to just take to the Lord our praise and adoration from our hearts and pray to Him. We have a great God that hears us even when we pray in silence from our hearts. The Holy Spirit is within us and He translates that to the Lord, and we're grateful to be able to do it tonight. So take just a few moments just to be quiet and know that He's God, share a prayer with Him, and I'll close out our prayer time, and then we'll get started in our lesson tonight. and greatly to be praised tonight and we're thankful Lord that even though you're a God who is great who is sovereign who's almighty you 
Lord, care deeply enough to involve yourself in each of our lives. And Lord, help us never to lose the wonder of that, that as sinful as we have been and sometimes are, Lord, you choose to relate to us and you have given us an open line of communication through the work of our Savior Jesus where we can come and take to you our prayers and just worship you from our hearts. And Father, also uh, take to you requests on behalf of needs in our lives and needs in the lives of others. Lord, I thank you for each person tonight who testified. Lord, we all uh, gave a great testimony when we acknowledged that heaven indeed did come down and glory filled our souls when Christ Jesus came in and forgave us of our sins and rightly related us to you through his atoning work. And so, God, uh, it's good just to come together and, and just say that we are saved. Thank you, Father, also for all the other testimonies that we've heard tonight. Lord, um, so many things that we can just look back on and see that you have done and are doing in our lives. And we just want to praise you for it tonight. Lord, we praise you for how you have been moving in just a remarkable way in the lives of, of young people in our church. Thank you, Father, for uh, our leadership with our youth and children and all the volunteers that work with them. Thank you, Lord, for a great week of Vacation Bible School. And Father, we just look forward to celebrating your work and your salvation in those hearts and lives as we experience a service of baptisms uh, this coming Sunday night. Father, I pray that you be with those who are going on the retreat on the weekend, that, Father, you once again would show yourself mighty in their hearts and lives and, and work, Lord, your work of grace within each and every one of them. Thank you, Father, that we can come together in this place and experience the freedom that we have to meet together, to worship, to read scripture, to sing a song of our faith. And I pray, Lord, that that would be something we always hold dearly, that we never take for granted the great freedoms we have in our country. Lord, you know that we have been through some trying days as a nation and I suspect, Lord, there will be many more of those coming up in the not distant future. And I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, calm people in our nation. I pray, Father, that you would help us uh, coming up to make good decisions. And, Father, when we engage the conversations, even with those, Lord, with whom we uh, sharply disagree, I pray, Father, that we would do it graciously and in ways, Lord, that represent Christ well. Father, thank you that we have an opportunity again tonight to open up and study together your word. It is indeed a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And I pray, Father, that we would learn it uh, even more tonight than we knew it before. I ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, have you forgotten that we've been working on one and done books of the Bible? We have started back with one in the Old Testament, looked at a few in the New Testament, those small one-chapter books of Scripture. Now, I'll tell you, it's going to be a little different as we land on this last one because I can't deal with everything in this one chapter book in one setting. So we're going to look at the theme of it tonight, the thesis of our last one chapter book that we're studying. And then we'll come back to it again next week at least and finish up. So just as a quick reminder, we 
learned that there was one one chapter book in the Old Testament, and that is the book of Obadiah. Now I'm going to put you to the test. Does anybody remember anything about the book of Obadiah? I'm not a very good teacher. <laughs> Does anybody remember anything about the book of Obadiah? Well, somebody state the obvious. It's a one chapter book. <laughs> it's the only one chapter book in the Old Testament. Anybody remember anything else about it? All right. I'm sorry. It's the shortest letter in the Old Testament, yes. But Paul didn't write it. Obadiah, the prophet, wrote it. And Obadiah is uh, an indictment on the Edomites, those people who uh, came through the lineage of Esau. And so they were people who dwelt down in the hill country, on the hillsides, on the other side of the Dead Sea. And if you remember, it's all about when the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem and the country of Judah, the Edomites, they followed suit. They came in to the country and they would pillage some of the areas that uh, were left behind there rather than uh, sticking up for the people of Judah. So that was Obadiah. We looked at Philemon, and Philemon is about what? I heard something. Yep, I'm hearing it over there uh, about a slave by the name of Onesimus who leaves this friend of Paul by the name of Philemon, ends up in Rome with Paul, and Paul writes this letter back to Philemon, and just a beautiful little letter that uh, is encouraging a brother in Christ to not look at one as a slave, but one as an equal to him in the grace of God. So we, we talked about that. We looked at Second John, and Second John is a lot like the letter that we'll start tonight. There was a problem with false teaching, so that's not a new problem within Christianity. Always remember that Satan has fought against biblical teaching from the very beginning of the church, and so John wrote to a group of people that needed encouragement as they were dealing with false teachers. If you remember 3 John, it had to do with a particular man in a particular church that was not nice. He was not gracious. He was not hospitable. And John wrote to, to that church encouraging them to receive people who would come in and teach biblical Christianity and be hospitable to them. And that brings us down to the last one that we'll begin looking at tonight, the book of Jude. If you struggle to find the book of Jude, go to the back of the book, find the book of Revelation, and then just move left. All right, left of Revelation, the next to the last book in the New Testament is the book of Jude. And as I've done all along, just to clarify where they are one chapter books, if you just see one single number, it's never the chapter, but it is simply the verse. Now, we're going to mix it up a little bit tonight because as I've done before, I can't do tonight. We have read the entire book as we've started. I'm not going to do that because we're really just going to focus on one verse, and I think you'll understand in just a few moments why we have to, but I do want to read the verses before and after that by a little bit so that you begin to get the flavor of the book of Jude. So here we go, beginning in Jude 1, 
Scripture says, Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Isn't that a beautiful snapshot right there of salvation? I, I'm not going to teach on verse 1 as we get past this in just a moment, but I want you to see how beautiful that is. Aren't we thankful for a Holy Spirit who convicts us and calls us to salvation? Uh, one of the great experiences of life. It's not comfortable, but it's a dynamic experience when you begin to learn about the Lord and you understand your sinfulness and God the Holy Spirit begins to operate in your heart to convict and to call you, to draw you into salvation. God sanctifies us as we participate with him in discipleship, and he preserves us. I'm thankful that my salvation does not depend on my spiritual ability to maintain it. I wasn't good enough to get it, and I'm still not good enough to keep it. God keeps my salvation for me. It's preserved in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 2, he talks about those blessings that he wants the reader of this little letter to receive. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Now, here's where I really want you to focus your attention because this is the verse we're going to come back to tonight. Jude writes and he says, Beloved, verse 3, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. We'll come back to verse 3. And then he begins to expose the problem that he's addressing in the letter here in verse 4. He writes, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So you see here that Jude is taking a very serious turn. And these unbelievers, and I'll talk more about this next week, but these unbelieving people, and we address this, those of you that were here Sunday night, in the book of Numbers. That's exactly what he's referring to here. Those people who would not cross on over into the promised land. You remember the 12 spies were sent. They came back. Rather than believing the godly report of Caleb and Joshua, the people listened to the 10 ungodly spies who convinced them that they could not go on over and cross into the land that God had given them because they didn't believe. And the Bible here in the book of Jude is reiterating that God destroyed those. Remember, every one of those who came up out of Egypt who at that point were over the age of 20, they perished in the wilderness while the younger people were blessed to go on to the promised land. And scripture says in verse 6, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he, re he reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these 
having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So let's think about who Jude is as the author, and then we'll talk about some other quick facts from the book of Jude so you'll understand a little more this little one chapter book of the of scripture. So he's very clearly identified in verse 1 as Jude and he also says that he is the brother of James. Now who is James? Understanding who James is helps you understand who Jude is because Jude says he's the brother of James. Does anyone happen to remember who James is? It says James, the brother of Jesus. Hey, you're right on the money. So we'll talk more about that in just a moment. I just want to go ahead and draw it out. This name Jude is actually a shortened form of what's actually in the Greek text. He's Judas in the Greek text. And by choice, it's translated as Jude to avoid obvious confusion. You know, since the first century A.D., there haven't been many Judas. Have you ever met a man named Judas? Probably not, right? Just like you've never met a lady named Jezebel. Now, you may use those names pejoratively every now and then. I used to hear my mamma say that. She would say, oh, she's just a Jesse Bell. That's the way Mamma would put it. And every now and then somebody will say, well, he, he, he's just a Judas. But I want you to see this practice of not ever wanting to confuse someone with the Judas who was the betrayer started all the way back when they began translating Scripture. So if you were to go to the Greek New Testament and be able to read a little Greek, you would see that it's actually his full name is Judas, but they do him a favor, these translators, by simply calling him Jude. As we have already drawn out, and Amanda was so quick to give us the answer, as the brother of James, Jude is also the brother of of Jesus. So this is one of Christ's half brothers that we're hearing from here. Since that's an interesting note, let me talk to you a little bit about the Lord's siblings. He did have half siblings. Half is all it could be because he was fathered by the Holy Spirit. You know, 100% miraculous. And there has been those in history who have tried to teach uh, the perpetual virginity of Mary. But Scripture does not uh, teach that. You know, Scripture very plainly teaches that Mary and Joseph, after Jesus, did indeed have other children. I'll give you uh, a couple of verses here. And I think this, I know it's in the book of Mark. It may also be in the book of Luke. I'm pretty sure it's in all three of those synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But definitely here in Matthew 13, verses 55 and 56, uh, this, as, uh, this comes out as people are beginning to criticize Jesus Someone remarks and says, is this not, referring to Jesus, the carpenter's son, just old Joseph, the carpenter's son, is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? So this is the good people of Nazareth talking about the earthly brothers and sisters that Jesus had. We don't know how many sisters Jesus had. 
It doesn't tell us that, but we do know that he has these four brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, who we call Jude as the author of this little book of the Bible. It's interesting to note that the brothers of Jesus did not follow him until after his death and resurrection. They didn't believe. They were unbelievers. And so John clearly identifies that for us in John chapter 7, verse 5, for even his brothers did not believe in him. Can, can you imagine that? You know, a couple of Sundays ago, we talked about how even somebody as wonderful and as knowledgeable as John the Baptist had a moment of doubt and sent back friends to Jesus to ask him, are you the Christ or should we look for another? So everybody, I think, at some point or another in their lives at least has these moments of doubts. And Jesus is able to bear up under that. And Jesus doesn't mind to answer our questions. But can you imagine, here's the Lord Jesus and his brothers. His brothers didn't even believe in him. I mean, this is only speculative, okay? I have no scripture to back this up, but, but can't you imagine that all their growing up years, they would have to observe Jesus doing things that only a God-man could do. You know, we know that because what did Jesus do at the age of 12? He did what? He, yeah, as they made that pilgrimage to the temple, you remember he confounded the leaders there in the temple and Mary and Joseph had to go back and get him because he wasn't in the caravan as they were heading north back to Nazareth. And so we have to imagine that his deity even as he would be a young person. And remember this, he didn't announce his public ministry until he was how old? About 30. So, you know, you've got 30 years of Jesus and how special would that have been to have grown up in a home with Jesus? Or, you know, maybe it was difficult. And I'm sure in some ways it was. But I, I just, I like to think about that and just press my imagination a little bit to think about here are these people who have literally grown up with Christ and no doubt at moments they had to see his deity, but they did not believe him. But the good news is, they did begin to believe him a little later. Scripture tells us specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus made his resurrection appearance known to at least his brother James because Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 7 that he was seen by James, then all the apostles and Paul goes on to talk about a list of people who did see the resurrected Christ. And so, for whatever reason, at least his brother James didn't believe him up to that point. You know, there's obviously something about seeing a man that you knew to be graveyard dead make a physical, real appearance to you. No question about it. That'll change you, right? That's why we say over and over that everything that we believe, everything that we hope for, really hinges on one event. And that's what? The resurrection 
of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ really died on a cross, was really buried, and really came out of his entombment three days later, then hands down, he is Lord. And every claim he makes, everything that he indicates is 100% trustworthy. I've talked to you before and, and told you that great quote, a lot of people quote it, that the great Christian thinker C.S. Lewis said many, many years ago, he said in Mere Christianity, one of his great books, that Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. And the resurrection does what? Disproves the first two things and proves that he is indeed Lord. So here's what we know. After his resurrection, seen by at least James, his brothers began to follow him. They placed their faith in him. And it really seems like all of Jesus' brothers served in some type of ministry after his ascension. Back to 1 Corinthians in chapter 9, verse 5, the scripture says, written here by Paul, do we have no right to take along a believing wife as do also the other apostles and who else? The brothers of the Lord and Cephas. I don't have time to get into uh, the context really of First Corinthians chapter 9, but suffice it to say that Paul was talking about uh, the authenticity of his apostleship. And he said that he had every right to be married and he had every right that as he traveled and he would engage in missions, he had every right to have a wife and to take her along with him because he says that the other apostles do that and so do the brothers of the Lord. So plural there, brothers of the Lord, it seems that possibly all four brothers of Jesus ended up not only just believing him, but in some type of ministry. Here's what we know without question. James, his brother, was the leader of the Jerusalem church. And then Jude, this other brother who wrote a letter that became part of our New Testament, is an itinerant, one who moved around, teacher and preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jude is known as that, someone who, who traveled as a teacher and a missionary, there's a few things we don't know. We don't know the exact location to which the letter was first sent. That's not identified. It's not like Paul writing to the church at Rome or the church at Corinth or what have you. It's, it's just not very clear there. It seems to be a letter that is written to a Messianic Jewish community. What I mean by that. These were evidently devout Jews who really knew the Old Testament. And we'll talk about this next week. Not only did they know the Old Testament, but they knew also some other Old Testament writings, not scriptural writings, but other books that were religious books. I mean, it'd be like me talking to you about, you know, the Bible but you also know maybe a book that was written by Billy Graham or a book that was written by some other well-known Christian. Um, we, we'll talk more about that next week and you'll see it. But, but here's the point that I want you to grasp right now. He's writing this book to a group of people who really, really, really knew the Old Testament because of the examples he gives, the things that he talks about, he assumes that they have familiarity with those things. So, 
That's the kind of people to whom he wrote. And here's the problem. He's combating the influence of corrupt teachers who had infiltrated the church. This is very much like what we talked about in 2 John and other books of the New Testament. So, you know, that's always been, listen to this closely, that's always been one of the main things, one of the primary works of Satan to get into the church and to try to substitute biblical doctrine with false doctrine. And so that's why Jay, or Jude rather writes. So let's talk here about his thesis, and it's in verse 3. Uh, I don't know why I put a B there. It's all verse 3. Jude writes, and he says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So uh, there's three things here in this one verse of Scripture in Jude's thesis that, that we'll talk about very briefly tonight before we have our time with our prayer list. Uh, first of all, he talks about the fact that salvation is common. I'll explain that to you in just a moment. He says that we should contend for the faith. And then number three, he indicates that the faith is unchanging. So first of all, he talks about our common salvation. So salvation is common. It's common in the sense that we're saved in common. Now, when he says a common salvation, that's not like us saying, well, those are just common shoes, or that's a common car, or that's just a common house. That's not why he uses the word common here, but he, he's talking about the fact that salvation is something that all of us who follow Jesus Christ has in common. We're all saved the same way. We're saved in common. You see, you're saved... And this is a beautiful thing. What we did earlier, we talked about we were saved on different days of the week and all of that. You know, here's the thing. It doesn't matter what year you were saved, what month out of the year you were saved in, or which day out of the month you were saved on, you were saved the same way I was saved. And I was saved the same way you're saved. Through God's grace, by placing my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But this commonness places us into a community. All right? And the community is what? It's what we have right now, being together, at least part of us being together as a church. So salvation is common. It's important that it puts us in a community and what this teaches us is that church participation is important. Some time ago, I read a survey where 70% of the people who responded to that survey said, you can be a good Christian and not involved in church. Well, I disagree with that. And I don't disagree with that, you know, because I'm a church worker or pastor or preacher, and I want to see more people in the congregation. That's not the thing there. Although those things are true, I want us to grow. I want us to see more and more people come. 
but I want people to be here because it's important. God did not design Christianity to be a Lone Ranger event. But he, he wants us to have fellowship because we have a lot in common. Our salvation is in common. And so the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, would say this, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. So, you know, people who want to be flippant about church attendance, they need to read the Bible <laughs> because the Bible says for us not to forsake coming together. Now, let me see if I have time to do this. I'm going to go ahead and do it regardless. Here's what I want to be very clear about. The Bible does not say that thou shalt have a Sunday morning, Sunday night, and a Wednesday night service. All right? We choose to come together on a Sunday because that's the first day of the week. And what happened on the first day of the week? Jesus Christ resurrected from the grave. And so, you know... I hate legalism. I'm not about legalism. So I'm not, I'm not talking about legalism here. And Sunday is not the Sabbath. It's the Lord's day. And in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, the Lord replaced a Sabbath day with a Sabbath principle. And that principle is... You know, we're not to go on and on and on and wear ourselves into the ground, but there ought to be moments in our lives and a moment, uh, a day in our lives when we slow down, we reflect on the goodness and the grace of God, and we allow ourselves to recharge. I can promise you this, for any preacher or anybody that's very active in Christian ministry, Sunday is not a Sabbath Right, Brother Luke? Sunday is not a Sabbath. Uh, in fact, I told Amy, and, you know, I feel it more and more because, you know, I'm not, I'm not as young as I used to be. And um, it's, you, you wouldn't understand. It's kind of like what mom used to say. Mom used to tell me things and she'd say, now, and you'll understand when you have one of your own. Y'all ever heard that before? You'll understand it when you have one of your own. And I understand what that means now. But, but it's also, you know, the, the work of preaching and teaching. You know, I got to tell you, on a Sunday night, after I have preached on Sunday morning and Sunday night, I come home dragging because that's work. Now, I know it's not like digging a ditch or something like that. But, but it is exhausting work. I'm getting way too off my point here. The bottom line is, I'm just trying to tell you tonight, I'm not trying to be legalistic about it, but brother or sister, and here I am talking to the choir on a Wednesday night. But listen, if you can go on and on and on in your quote-unquote Christian life and excuse yourself from the services and the fellowship of the church, there's a real problem there. You'll never be what God wants you to be when you divorce yourself from activity in the church. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says, as we see the day approaching, as we're getting closer and closer to the coming of Christ, we ought to do it even more. We, we need to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That's what it means that salvation is common. We're all saved the same way, and that commonness of our salvation places us into a community. Now, 
Next week, we'll talk about the error that Jude exposes here, and he makes these stark comparisons to other people. We read a few of them tonight, like the Israelites that died in the wilderness, etc. cetera. Uh, we, we'll talk about the, the problem, but notice before he gets to the problem, Jude writes and he says, I'm writing to you a letter that I did not intend to write. Did you notice that there? He said, I was diligent back there in verse 1 that I would write to you about our common salvation, but I found it necessary to write to you, and he tells us here in verse 3, to contend for the faith. So what is the faith? When he talks about the faith here, he's not talking about personal faith. You know what personal faith is. That's the faith you have that you placed into Christ, trusting in the grace of God that has made you born again. That's not what he's meaning here. When he talks about the, the faith here, he's talking about the doctrines, the essential truths of the gospel that are 100% true and biblical that all true Christians hold in common. Now, I know that uh, we get into some things and we split hairs on some things and, and because of that we have uh, different denominations and all that kind of thing. But if a church is a true Christian church, a biblical church, there is a body of doctrine that they cannot deviate from. And I don't have time to, to enumerate that tonight, but it's basic biblical doctrine. Uh, number one, that the Bible is true, that it's 100% inerrant, that it's inspired, that it's the Word of God, that Jesus was virgin born, that Jesus lived a perfect life, that Jesus died on a cross for our sins, that he resurrected, that he's coming again. There is a faith, an authentic faith, and that's what Jude is talking about here. That word contend is an athletic word, and it speaks of, of doing your diligence. In other words, if you're going to be successful in whatever sport you might play, whether it's baseball, basketball, football, racquetball. What's the big thing now? Pickleball. Any pickleball players? Don't knock it till you try it. It's, it's really a lot of fun. But anyway, whatever sport that you're going to play, if you're going to be successful in competition, it means that you've been diligent to practice that you've worked out, that you have practiced your sport. That's what it means to contend. How many of you are excited about the Summer Olympic Games? This weekend, right? Didn't it start this weekend? And so we're going to watch all these Olympians from all over the world, and it's just fascinating to see them do what they do. My favorite Olympian of all times, is Michael Phelps, the swimmer. I, I think he's the GOAT, by the way, the greatest of all times, greatest athlete. You cannot argue against that when you look at his hardware. But I also remember when he was competing, they, you know, they do these backstories. That's what makes watching the Olympics fun from your television because they go back and do the backstories. And they talked about all the eating he did. Now, you know, based on that, I could probably be an Olympian too. <laughs> but he had to have the caloric intake because of everything he was burning. And it showed his repetitions and all the things that he did to be so successful. That's what it means to contend, to know your thing, 
to understand it, to work with it, so that when you see the false thing coming along, you're very quickly able to detect it. And so just very quickly, how do we do this? How do we contend for the faith by supporting faithful biblical ministries, by warning against unbiblical teaching? Now, I want you to listen to me carefully. I don't want anybody being a jerk. We have too many jerks out there. But if you're in a conversation and somebody says something and they say this is a biblical truth or they try to teach some component of theology and it's in error, it's heresy, you ought to correct that mildly, you know, not in a way that causes somebody to want to reach out and grab you and choke you or something like that. But you ought to to warn against unbiblical teaching. And then number three, we contend for the faith as we live out our biblical lives. What is the one thing that proves what we believe? Our argument? That's it. The thing that proves what we believe is our conduct, our lives. So we contend by living the life that God has given us to live guided by biblical principles. This one goes quick and we're finished. The other thing that Jude tells us here is that our faith, this body of beliefs, that we hold is unchanging. It was delivered once for all. Once means that the faith was delivered one time and it doesn't need to be delivered again. In other words, be careful. Let me just give you a big clue here. If you ever hear of someone calling himself the apostle so-and-so, or prophet, so-and-so, that's flashing light number one that you need to get away from that teaching. There are no apostles. I'm one who preaches what God has already delivered through the apostles. And I preach what God has already delivered through the Old Testament prophets. So the biblical doctrine that we contend for is what we've already been exposed to in the Word of God. It's been delivered through the complete Word of God once for all. It does not need to be delivered again. If you hear somebody to say something like, I have new insight or I I have a word from the Lord, I'm not saying to you that God cannot speak to you, but when God speaks to you, it will always be in concert with the word he's already given us. If somebody says they have a word from the Lord and it does not match up with biblical truth, then it is not a word from the Lord. We distribute this truth again and again. It doesn't mean once delivered, that we don't continue to tell it. We always tell it, but it was delivered by God to the world through the apostles and the prophets once. We're built up, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, having been built up on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. I told you that you have to get that verse down, verse 3 of Jude, to really be able to spring forward to the remainder of what he talks about here in this little letter. Any question about what we've talked about tonight? It's like this. 
You know, they tell you that the best way to, to learn how to uh, tell if something is false is to know the real thing the best you can. People who handle money, I'm told that uh, they, rather than training them to uh, be able to detect the counterfeit, they train them in the look and the feel of real money. And when that which is not real comes to your hands, you know it very quickly. That's what Jude is talking about here. All right, let's turn our attention to our prayer list. Are you aware, and it's been a week or two since we've been able to go over it, so are you aware of names on the current prayer list that we need to remove?